Welcome to Committed to Ministering Together. I'm Nerida Taylor Bates with the Association of Adventist Women. Today, we are coming to you after a tragic school shooting, and we have stopped our regular programming because we need to take this time to talk about what we're feeling, what the Christian response is to tragedy. So um, I thought that I would begin tonight with reading a bit from Job. Uh, the friends of Job get a bad rap, but I'd like to read to you beginning from Job 2.11. When Job's three friends, Eliphath, and Tamanite and Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him. They set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. And then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. And no one said a word because they saw how great his suffering was. And so we've come here today to talk about silence and respect. It says in uh, Psalm 13, one, how long Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Habakkuk 1.1 1, 1 continues that. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Then uh, Psalm 6.3, my soul is in deep anguish, how long, Lord, how long? And at the end of the Bible, we read in Revelation, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth? Let's bow our heads. Dear Father, we are at a loss for words. We see this tragedy unfold like so many others that we've seen. It brings back horrible memories for many. And we have to face the fact that the world is terribly broken at times and the suffering is very great. Please be with us and talk to us as we have a moment of silence together. Dear Father, we want you to be close to the victims in Texas tonight. And at this stage, all we can do is to say how horrific and terrible. Please be with us in our grief. Sit beside us and be silent with us. Amen. 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 Donna, does the Bible talk about our response and how to mourn with those who are mourning? You know, I, I, I think I would like to spend a little more time on the story of Job and uh, on the fact that uh, they started, the friends started out right by just sitting there, acknowledging his pain. Being in his shoes, they didn't go into a home because there was no more home. They didn't require special food or special accommodation. They just sat down with him on that heap of garbage where he was sitting and felt with him 
his pain, his loss, his questions, his desperation, his grief, his hopelessness, his powerlessness. So as Christians, many times we feel like, oh, we have to do something or we have to say something. And uh, I want to, you know, tell you from experience and from what I've read and heard that just being there for somebody, it means in those moments more than a thousand words of encouragement. Of course, mourning with those who mourn means being in tune to, to their feeling and to their journey of grief. Of course, we want healing for them. We want them to reach that place of peace and acceptance, but they have to go through the valley of the shadows. Mm -hmm. So you just hold their hand, remind them to take one more step and one more breath and one more sip of water when they cannot eat anything for days or weeks. And just watch over your brother or sister, be your brother or sister's keeper in those moments. And like you said yesterday, sometimes you have to step up and you know, keep the household going, take the other kids to school, feed the dog, uh, fix the car, take care of the yard because a grief like this is absolutely debilitating. You can die from a grief like this. Yeah. And, and just to take that time now as a caregiver, sometimes you're going to need to vent or to express other emotions or to process the grief that you're sharing mm -hmm. from the person with tragedy. And it's very appropriate to vent that to to process that um apart from the person who's mourning um yeah. so yeah, that definitely. you you remember to be mindful of where you are but purposefully uh take the time you need so that you can come back refreshed to be the support that's needed you know mm -hmm. since you mentioned uh that bible verse more, uh, mourn with those who mourn. I also remember um, the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And I remember how Jesus cried when, with Mary and Martha when Lazarus was dead. Yes, even, yes. even though he was going to raise him from the dead right yes. yes so many times we ask ourselves uh what is god's response where is god in this story and it's it's not easy to answer that question it goes back to the issue of theodicy how can you uh, you know put together in the same sentence in the same world uh a powerful, loving God and the issue of suffering and evil in the world. And uh, thank you, Francis, for mentioning the moment that Jesus wept. Because when we ask ourselves, where is God in this story? I believe God is weeping. I, I've heard the story as a child and it left a profound impression on me. Uh, a father whose child died ask the question, where is God in this story? Where was God when my, my son died? And the answer was, God was in the same place where he was when his child died. It might seem, you know, superficial, but we go back to verses like Jeremiah 8, 21, since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn and to the promise that God is walking with us in the valley of the shadows. I know for sure that God feels our pain. 
and and to that end i think as christians we're supposed to be christ-like which means that we have to go there and be there and and that's difficult sometimes you worry oh will i wake them up with my phone call will i will i make them cry will i be a burden mm -hmm. um and and so we have to remember that very delicately and and with great empathy and watching our cues we need to be there and go there and and come over with our cleaning stuff and clean the bathroom or the kitchen or the garden in the front yard, uh, you know, to see what needs to be done and to, to, to remember them. Yeah. And sometimes it's just as simple as asking, what do you need today? What do you need right now? Do you need to sleep? Do you want me to take the kids out for, you know, to feed them while you take a nap or while you express your grief by screaming if you need to, but you don't want to scare the kids? Um, yeah. Just listen. Being a, being a good listener, it's, it's one of the most important uh, things you can be in situations like this. It, it's a very long process. And as it goes on, that being together m morphs slowly into helping them reintegrate. Uh, when, it's a, when they're ready, inviting them to, to go out to a quiet evening or uh, eventually to, to a party to... Mm -hmm to keep them integrated into a social circus, circuit, to reintroduce them as their morning is easing. Yeah. Uh, somebody, somebody said something to me recently. Um, she said, you know, I have friends that uh, it's, it's been two months and they feel like I should be done grieving and they should mm -hmm. feel like I should uh, go out with them. And um, I told them, you know, just keep asking me, but I'm not ready now, but keep asking. So the worst thing that you can do as a friend is to put a time limit on somebody else's grief. There is no such time limit. Um, grief is the price we pay for love. It's the most beautiful right. definition of grief that I've encountered. So like not two love stories are alike, not to grief stories are alike. So let's let's respect the other person's grief. And you never move away from grief. You might be able to move forward with your life. You might engage in meaningful activities, but once you lost your child, you'll always be somebody who lost a child. In, in grief. Amen. Yeah. Amen. yeah. And I, I like that thing, ask me again. I, I think when my mother died and people were asking me for things that I couldn't do, there was just a little bit of hope in that. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not ready, but, but somebody thinks I might be ready. Okay. Somebody will be there when I'm, when I'm ready. Yes. Um, and I think it's important we don't forget them after this initial shock, you know, like you're saying, you know, check with them later down the road, because this all takes so long to deal with, if you ever do. It, it does. And I think that this kind of tragedy brings back the grief that other people have that either is is there because it was a severe grief or, or they need to process parts of it. Um, and so for you and I, it may be 
a tragic thing for a day or two that we see on the news, but for other people, it puts them in a tailspin that, that, you know, can be weeks because of the grief that it's compounding. Yeah. You know, grief is cumulative. It basically never really goes away. And the more you advance in age and the more grief you accumulate, you sometimes you tend to be in a constant state of grief. Um, because it, it comes back, as you said, every time we experience another loss, all the other, the previous losses come back to us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, you, you are still able to have joy. You are still able to have meaning, mm -hmm. but you are also grieving. Yeah, I, I think one of the, one of the things that uh, one has to remember, because people always say, oh, you'll heal. But when you think of healing, you think of a broken leg and then, it, then it's fine afterwards. But I really think that uh, what you're saying, Dana, is that, that really it, it, the hole will always be there. You, may, you will have meaning, you know, again, you know, as, as time goes by, but that really never goes away. And you can, and, you know, it's, when you have a loss, like you say, it's because you love so much that um that it really so to me I, I try not to when i'm talking with people who are grieving i never really mention the word heal uh or i talk about it because pe people refer that as healing but it really isn't healing it's it's being able to accept it and go forward and know that the that god is going to see you through this mm -hmm. um and so it's it's more of that 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 hole will always be there like you say once you've lost a child you've you're you've lost a child that's not going to go away whether you have five children after that that's still that loss will always be there and yeah. so um i think if you know as we say we listen we we try to put you know we, we mourn with them and um help them through that journey because it and it'll take people it varies from person to person of how long or how ready they will feel mm -hmm. so that's that's so true. So I hear you saying that we should probably reach out to our friends who have been mourning uh, today, tomorrow, the next day, um, to see how they're doing now. Yeah, that yeah. They, they may need a little more attention uh, than they've been needing before today. And, and like, you know, simple things like, you know, I'm going to the store. Is there anything I can pick up for you? Uh, is there something that you need done right there, at, you know, in your home that I can help you with? Um, so it really is reaching out and letting them know that we're thinking of them and that we're here for them. Yeah. I remember when I first got heart disease, uh, I was depressed. I was stuck in the house. I could not I had to plan my day when I could go up and down the stairs because it was only twice a day that I could manage it. And after a few months, one of my dear friends invited me to go out and I, I had gotten better enough that I could walk all the way to the car at the curb and walk into a restaurant. And I talked flat out the whole time. I think she said two sentences. And uh, when we were done, I thanked her and she said, oh, it's fun and took me home. And I thought, she's never going to come again. I just couldn't help myself. I just had so much to say. And a few months later, let's go out to eat. And she's done it for 10 years. And every time that we go out, I, I think in my head, I just can't believe that she stuck with it. Um, when I was grieving and, and the way that I dealt with it was just to talk. Um, and so sometimes you just have to stick with it. I just got a notification on my phone that 
the death toll raised to 21, 19 children and two adults. Oh. It's, it's so heartbreaking. And, you know, it, I, I feel like every word I'm saying, it's, it's almost a sacrilege because all we should do is to weep with them and to pray for them. And it, it brings me, me back to, to the story of the children in Rama and Jeremiah's verse, a voice is heard in Rama, mourning and great weeping. For Rachel lost her children and she is refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Mm -hmm. It brings us to the idea how fragile life is and how precious every moment is. Yeah. And those days, I am sure that you have them. I'm sure we've all had them, but uh, Donna, you must have the most um, when you have a death at work and uh you know you come home and all you can do is just walk in the door and hug your kids and and uh my kids have got to the point where uh when they were about 12 they would mm -hmm. just turn around and say who died and when they were about 16 they would turn around and hug me back Mm. and say tell me about it um because there's not much more you can do you know how did we get so lucky to still have our kids yeah i hurt whenever i hear a, it, it touches me as a mother whenever i hear about a child dying you know, I really do feel with them, and I'm sure other mothers do too, because it's so close to home. It could have been ours. Yes. Dahlia, would you like to start us in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we come before these have been moments that the tragedy has happened, and we really have no words to, to really say anything except that our heart just aches. And we are so sad that these families are having to go through this with a senseless uh, occurrence and it should not have happened, Lord. But I want to ask you to be with them and, and help us to be there for them in any way that we can. We can pray for these families. We can assure them that God never leaves them and that you are there with them. So, Lord, we ask this, that you put your hands on them and help them feel your presence, that the Holy Spirit can just envelop them and just be with them, with them. We thank you, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Dear Lord, we ask humbly that you be with these families, circle them with your love, and help them know that you're grieving and crying with them. And that it's not your will that these things happen, but that you will walk with them through the valley of the shadow of death. We believe that you'll hear an answer and please use us to encourage them. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Dear God, we ask that you would give us empathy, that you would allow us to be broken by the things that break your heart that we would have your eyes to see how best to support and to help and remind us to, to just be there and say it's time to breathe again. Thank you that you also know how to mourn and to sit with us and be together. Amen. God, Amen. guide us and strengthen us and give us courage. Be with all the families that are suffering greatly in Texas right now. Walk with them, hold their hand, carry them through. Strengthen them and comfort them. 
like only you know how to do it. Bless all the other children in the school and heal their hearts, God, and continue to be with them in their life. And we know that they might suffer from PTSD greatly. We don't, it's, it's hard to hold on to hope in this moment, but we hold on to our faith and we, we believe there is some hope in the future. And we trust you to walk with us and give us wisdom and peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and uh, keep breathing and keep drinking a little water here and there and doing the things that you need to do as you process and mourn today. And we'll see you again tomorrow.